I don't want to lose the ability to enter into a game space and be like, I'm in control. Yeah. I'm the author. I agree. As opposed to an Artur experience, like you were mentioning earlier, I, I want to be one of the artists as a player. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris discuss recent trends in gaming and speculate about where the industry is headed. Plus, Watch Dogs 2, a No Man's Sky update, the Game Awards, and the return of my tribe or trash. The Backward Compatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 85 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, everybody. And we're joined by Doc. Hey, hey. And Jim, how about you tell us what our media topic is going to be today? Um, well, uh, fresh off uh, the Game Awards and PlayStation Experience, we've got to see what games are in store in the next couple of years. thought it might be interesting to, uh, based on these trends, see where games might go in the next 10 years. Cool. Should be interesting. I know we've had discussions about this uh, and related topics before, mm-hmm. but that was like, you know, a year ago, two years ago. So it's always interesting to see how, you know, that time can change the uh, the, tra- the trajectory that we're seeing. Mm-hmm. I was wrong then, but I'm right now. <laughs> <laughs> it will be right forever. This time, this time we've got it. Yay. <laughs> Until I'm right later. <laughs> uh, but lots of, uh, lots of timely content on this episode, so it should be a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, but we're going to open up with the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. I went out and bought the uh, the new Watch Dogs 2, uh, the sequel to Watch Dogs from Ubisoft, and y'all that have been following us from, for a while might remember that uh, Richard Richard Worth actually wrote his first article, I believe, about the very first Watch Dogs mm. game, which was kind of an ex- almost an experiment, like Ubisoft dipping their toes into this open-world, GTA-like mm-hmm. genre. It was one of those games that was uh, very highly hyped and a little bit disappointing when it finally came out. Yes, um, it, it didn't live up to the hype, and it was actually a pretty disappointing game. I think Watch Dogs 2 addressed a lot of the concerns people had with the original, um, such that it was a, a better experience. I'm enjoying it much more, I'll say that okay. much. But it still has a lot of flaws to it. Ubisoft still really hasn't nailed the GTA formula. I don't think anyone really kind of can. <laughs> but aside from Rockstar, well, you obviously. think that's what they're trying to do? Oh no, definitely. Oh, okay. It's they they put their own spin on it, but it's definitely an open world game, very similar to GTA in the sense that um, you're in a city. There's people you can interact with them. Um, you have weapons. You can steal cars. Mm. But they add hack- hacking is a big part of the game. Right. Well, I played the first one and mm-hmm. it was okay. But I thought of it more in terms of its repetitive elements as being an Ubi game. I yes. Mean, honestly. No, you're it, absolutely right. It, it just felt like a modern version of uh, Assassin's Creed. Mm-hmm. And, and this one, I think, goes – it tries to distinguish itself a little more. So if you enjoyed the first one, I would recommend – I mean, if you enjoyed the first one in any way mm-hmm. and you like open world games, I'd recommend trying Watch Dogs 2. Well, the parts I, I didn't like about the first Watch Dogs was whenever they railroaded you. Yeah. And so this one, I wouldn't say – it. I don't want to get too into the, the story per se, but let me just put it this way. So um, I didn't really feel the characters in the original Watch Dogs stood out at all. Oh, I agree. Um, or the story was that interesting. In this, in the new Watch Dogs 2, actually the, char- the characters are probably the best part of the game. Oh. So uh, you play uh, Marcus, who is this hacker in San Francisco. It's, it all takes place in the San Francisco Bay Area. So you have San Francisco... Um, Oakland and some of the surrounding areas are recreated pretty well. Actually, they get a lot of the landmarks. Right. Yeah, how is the scale? Because actually, I saw someone post a um, like a short little GIF of mm-hmm. um, some gameplay, and they were comparing the view outside their window of the San Francisco skyline across the bay, mm-hmm. and then they were showing that in uh, um, in Watch Dogs Two, and it actually looked pretty close. Yeah, it's it's they, they certainly. They certainly cut out some of the monotony, I I guess you could say, of certain cities where, because all all cities have just areas that kind of look the same, so they just really want to give you the theme and the flavor of the city and and hit, like, the most important landmarks. Sure. Um, But I think they did actually a really good job of it. Um, So I I think that's one of the better things that the game has. Um, But I can't really tell if this was on purpose or not. Um, It's about hackers, but the way that they 
treat hackers in this game, it's almost like they're getting it from the 90s movies, <laughs> like the movie hackers, or like maybe the Matrix, or just the way that hackers are, are or, or maybe like they went to 4chan one too many times and thought, this is how hackers are, are, are. like everyone at 4chan is a hacker and they just want to talk about well, everything has Hollywood uh, it, So are you, are you talking like uh, the news is perception of anonymous as yes, a terrorist literally. Group? And in fact, yeah. in fact, you literally, um, you have these videos that you put out when you do a big hacking job mm -hmm. and they're just absurd. It's like someone, it's like these, these silly videos with a whole bunch of like, you know, cuts and, and it, like the old stuff that we used to do for um, um, the art for Doc's art class mm -hmm. with with where you'd cut up all the video and made yeah. it seem really oh, like, yeah. like silly and mm -hmm. um, sound like layering the words and all that and, the, and what you say. Mm -hmm. So it's it's very much like that. Um, they have the guy inside a mask. It's not the guy the guy Fox mask, but it's a very similar type anonymous face uh -huh. and talking about you know corruption and all this kind of stuff and we're here to we're here to liberate the people and all this and <laughs> it just it comes across as very um corny mm -hmm. and also hypocritical because of some of the things you do in the game to accomplish your goals which is another thing too you actually can you can kill people in this game and you can use guns but it doesn't really make sense for your character to use guns, hmm. so it just feels really weird. Like they, they, I don't like they kind of felt like they had to have. If it's an open world action game, it needs to have a shooter element to it. They that's what it just... felt like. And you have a stun gun, and I I normally don't even use the guns. I normally just use my because you have a really cool weapon. It's like a um, I forget. There's a name for. It. I think it's like a, a monkey's claw. I think mm. they call it. It's a um, an eight ball, like a pool pool ball, mm -hmm. on a um, climbing rope. So so he kind of spins it around and hits mm -hmm. someone with it. It's kind of like a flail. Oh, okay. Um, it's actually a deadly weapon if you were to actually use oh, it. Yeah. So I don't know if I'm knocking people out or killing them. Gee. But they never get back up again, so. And, you know, not not to get you know too far off into this territory, but stealth games in general, I felt that this game could have been more of a hacking, stealthing, stealth type game because mm -hmm. they do have stealth elements and hacking elements as opposed to focusing on the action and the gunplay. Um, something maybe a little more like Thief, mm -hmm. where they technically had combat, but you never wanted to get in combat right. because the combat was horrible. Avoided at all costs. Uh, and it was meant to be. It was meant to be like you get a, you get an attack as a soldier, you're going to probably get killed. Mm -hmm. um, so you're supposed to just avoid combat. Um, in this game, you can fight, and I, it, it's the AI is so stupid. At first, the game... It's really this weird sort of like like break where I was so frustrated when I first played the game because I thought it just it felt like the game was cheating the way that they would see you it didn't make any sense to me at first mm. it just didn't feel natural it took me a bit to kind of see like the mechanics and how it works but then once I understood it it was extremely easy to just trick everyone mm. like just uh -oh. oh look someone sees me ha huh, I'm just gonna make his phone ring and now he looks at his phone and then I walk up and hit him <laughs> in the back of the head you know like, oh there's another guy that like three people that see me at the same time no big deal it's like I just drop a little you know electroshock thing it's nothing so the game the game is actually relatively easy once you kind of know what you're doing, mm -hmm. and so I try to approach missions differently, which is a, which is a good thing. They do let you approach missions in different ways. Nice. Um, you have two little buddies that are with you that you kind of create. They're they're drones, so you have like an R RC car and a uh, flying quadcopter, <laughs> and so you use them for scouting. Or you can take your little drone. He can go out and he can uh, taunt people. Hmm. Like just walk up and start insulting someone, and then they chase after him. You can lure him into areas or stuff like that. Um, Not a trick, I swear. Yeah, <laughs> and then of course the hacking is a big part of the game. So there's a right. lot of little things that you do with hacking. That's some of the most fun is you're just driving around and you can hack other people's cars. Um, but this game kind of has this thing where at times you feel like because the, the character the writing with the characters is so good, you think well. Is it actually some sort of a, of a satire of hackers? That, it, that they actually know what they're mm, doing? Mm -hmm. But it's it's both funny and serious at the same time. You're not. I honestly don't even know what sort of tone they're. You're going an action for. hacker, man. Mm -hmm. That's what you are. Yeah. I'll say whatever they are going for. It's funny. So I like it. I think it's entertaining. <laughs> uh, it does fall into that trap of Ubisoft games where some of the missions are too repetitive. Yeah. That being said, um, definitely pick up Watch Dogs too if you like open world games. It seems it's gotten kind of a bad rap from some people. I, I've noticed. I think it kind of got lost in the shuffle with some of the other games that came out around it. This is Inbox, where the crew responds to listener questions, comments, and letters to the editor. To join the discussion, email inbox at backward-compatible.com. All right, guys, I'm about to say some dirty words. No Man's Sky. Uh, there's been an update. Do I need to excuse myself? 
<laughs> you might need to. Yeah, you might. <laughs> honestly. Um, okay, so we should probably talk about the the meta of the update a little bit as well uh, as the update itself. Um, but basically, the shock and amazement is there was an update with almost complete silence from the devs. I mean, we we talked about the the place being abandoned and, and mm-hmm. shut up, and that there was nobody there, and we expected nothing to come out, and all the promises were broken, and blah, blah, blah. and it, it, what what's happened is um, no, it's like guys, we've been listening. Uh, it's been a it's a really tough couple of weeks. Was the announcement on Twitter, um, and you just you, you just you just don't know, man. You just don't know what we've been through, and um, we don't know what they've been through because they're not telling us, but. It doesn't matter because we, what we've got is what they're calling the foundation update. And that is kind of a little bit punny as well as other things. Basically what they're saying is, okay, here's the basic framework for stuff that's coming. And most of it has to do with small fixes that I think that uh, were very meaningful. And um, the new features are base building. Mm-hmm. Basically having a home base. Important things that we talked about on the show like having teleporters to be able to go back to a world. It's not just about leaving and never turning back. It is about finding a place that you can call home and then building that place up. It's about being able to throw down uh, robots and, and things like that. And I think that for what it is, they did a very good job of an update. It's almost a third the size of the full game itself, if that tells you anything. That said... There's been a lot of commentary about it, including commentary on uh, to us. Yeah. Um, so we actually got a, uh, a comment from Brad. He says, not to play devil's advocate or anything, but isn't a home base counterintuitive to the game's core theme of exploration and delving into the unknown? The answer is no, Brad. I was actually going to say, that, that was going to be my comment. <laughs> I, didn't even, I hadn't even read that, and that was actually going to be my comment. <laughs> really? Yes. And I, so I actually completely agree with him. Excellent. Yeah. All right, so, so now you and I can argue. <laughs> so, so, Jim, tell us what your point of view is then on that. Well, as someone that was not really that interested in the, in the game itself, but from what, I, from what I've heard from everyone that's been playing it, it's all about exploration. And right. The whole point is you're in this massive world, you know, procedural generation. It could go on forever, I guess. There's tons of things to explore. That's the whole point, right? Yes. So if you just have a home then doesn't that kind of defeat the purpose and you just like start building up one base? Okay, so... And you constantly return to it and keep building it up. It just feels like... Pretend like I made a really compelling argument yeah. about appealing to different gamer types, okay? Okay. And put that in your hat. So now we've got the gamer type who's like, I'm going to sit in this world and I'm just going to do it and that's great and I'm all happy now, okay? Now let's address those who aren't interested in doing that and, and are the explorer game type such as myself who are actually a lot more interested in exploring the galaxy like you just mm-hmm. talked about there's two ways you can explore the galaxy one is you get in your ship and you go and it is a journey it is a it's like the game journey you never turn back and you're always going towards the center of the galaxy which is what it kind of uh kites you towards and then spoiler alert when you get to the center of the galaxy what happens is uh it says basically congratulations, not even that, and then jumps you to the outer edge of another galaxy. You basically just start over. And so it's infinite in that sense. It, and it, it becomes not about the destination, but about the horizon. Okay, It's very profound. Pretend, pretend I just said something really profound. <laughs> I, I, I'm actually still... I'm, I'm, okay. I'm so, lost at that. You go to the center, and then it teleports you out and says, here ba- you go, try again. It basically, but it's a different galaxy. Not that it matters because the assets are so low. <laughs> I would be so pissed. And then people happened. were. People were extremely, very, very. Is that angry what happened to your, your computer? I know you've been having computer no, problems. No, no, no. <laughs> and, and I, never, I never got that far. <laughs> you just drop kicked it. Because as you might recall, my story is a little bit different. Mm. My story was that I actually found this really wonderful, rich world on about the third system that I went to. Um, I called it Mossy Land. And it was basically a, an Eden. Without animals, it was perfect weather, uh, beautiful flora, and uh, filled with albumin pearls, which are worth like a hundred thousand credits each. Did you say had like pillars of gold all over the place? And pillars here? of gold, right? And 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 like, uh, I just I just walked around and became a multi deca millionaire within a day. Got in my ship, left, and it was, ow, this planet's trying to kill me. Ow, this planet's trying to kill me. Ow, this planet's trying to kill me. I'm going, I'm going to do something else. And I thought about turning around and going back to my home planet, that one I liked so much, but there was no reason to. 
in the original update, okay? Uh, in, the, in the original game, I should say. Um, there literally was no reason to go there except to just gain more money for the sake of gaining money. And you can buy technology and buy the win that way. But I was like, you know what? I'm just going gonna, gonna to push forward. And I pushed forward. I did the Atlas quest, and they sent me through a black hole. And when you go through a black hole, you end up a couple hundred thousand light years, not towards the center, mind you, but either clockwise or counterclockwise. And you don't actually get but about as close to the center as you would be with the strongest warp drive on one warp jump. So this is a huge myth right there. It doesn't take you any closer to the center. So what it ended up doing for me was putting me way, way, way far away from the super rich place that I started, and I suddenly realized I'm playing a different game. I'm playing Voyager. My quest is now to get home. And it became fun for me, and I played for weeks um, trying to get home, building up my technology so that I could have meaningful jump drive that could take me eight systems instead of two. And I finally got there, but then I burned out. Fast forward to now. A couple of uh, very key important things were in this update, like having a home base, making it so that if I can ever get back to Mossy Land, I can build a base there, and that will be meaningful. And then my exploration from that point will not be to head in one direction, but it'll be find out everything around in free roam mode to find out everything around Mossy Land. Who are my neighbors? Am I near the Klingons? Am I near the, uh, the Vulcans, right? Uh, who, who are threats to me? What is the cool stuff around me? And I will just name everything in my neighborhood so that if anybody comes within uh, 10 light years of Mossy Land, they're going to see Discovered by Dr. Brack. Discovered by Dr. Brack. Discovered that uh, everything is going to be discovered by me because it will be my region and it's going to feel like I have a civilization there. So I noticed uh, you were saying when you get back, so you still haven't gotten back? No, and I'm having an immense fun time trying to. So have you considered that you may never actually be able to? Yeah. It's the entire, way that's set up? Well, I should be able to. Of course you should be able to. But I have a waypoint set that I've right. never deleted. And so because it's heading me towards that waypoint and heading me towards the, the Atlas, which is actually in, in orbit above it as well, um, it should, I've calculated, it should take me about 300 jumps to get there. So right now, I'm sitting on about 2 million credits. I've got my own um, massive freighter ship, which is one of the things they added in there. Uh, being a deck of millionaire gives you the opportunity to load it up and be like, oh, I'll take that one. <laughs> and so I just bought the first one I saw. Um, and I haven't even built a base yet because I'm going to wait until I get, quote unquote, home to build my base. So this is kind of a unique player experience for me that I am having. My own narrative is inserted into it. In that sense, I can completely understand why some people will be like, um, play with it, play with it, play with it. Okay, I'm still done. What are your thoughts, Chris? So in kind of response to Brad's uh, question, I think that no, um, adding bases doesn't defeat the purpose of exploration games. I think what it does is add, and this is something that I talked about a little bit more in depth when we did our episode on exploration, um, but I think that it adds much needed context. It gives you yes. a place from which you are setting forth and a place that you're trying to improve and advance through your explorations. Um, I think that, you know, if you kind of look at the hero's journey, and this is more a story structure thing, but I think it applies to this gameplay as mm -hmm. well. Oh, for sure. You need the the homeland that you cross a threshold into the unknown. But if everything is unknown and there's not really any point, there's no grounding, um, I felt what was lacking in No Man's Sky was any sense of why am I doing this. Yes. Aside from just, like, you know, the... But the the thrill of discovering the same procedurally generated planets is over this and over really again. giving you that context? Not yet, but what it, it is is like a step is. in the right direction. And so I think that do you think a game that's released shouldn't be taking steps in the right direction? Well, no, and and, and that gets back to my Sorry, core. I'm getting, I'm getting way off. You are, <laughs> but this gets back to my core, my core, 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 <laughs> core thing that I think solves all the No Man's Sky problems. They priced it at full price for a game that should have been alpha. Yeah. Had they, I agree with you completely. Had they released yeah. it for twelve bucks and called it an alpha, and then said in six months we're going to release the next major update, and they wouldn't have had to. They could have done it in three. They could have done it in two because the I don't think the community would have backlashed the way it did. But I think what happened, and we've talked about this before, is the producer stepped in and they said, uh, guys, if you want to get paid, here's the contract, and we're circling the part that says you're going to release it by this date, and you're going to have this in it, and now I want you to strip out all this content, and oh by the way, it's full price. And I think that they just had them. I think, I think they were locked into a contract. And I think the most v valuable insight into that being mm. true is their silence. Well, 
let me say one thing. Just, just to again be the devil's advocate, we because we don't know if it was them wanting money, the producers, whatever. I know. Um, when they released this new update and they broke their silence, as you mm-hmm. say, do you know what date that was? No. The exact day? No. Why? It was Cyber Monday. Yeah. So, just pointing that out. But it was free. I'm just saying. I'm, I'm just pointing out. Get more attention so that people buy it. Okay. I don't think that's a bad strategy, and I don't. I'm not saying it, it is because they're going to have to rebuild their out. player base. Honestly, if they I'm had walked out. away and said, "We screwed the pooch on this one. Forget it. Let's go do something else." Aside from the fact that I don't think any of those guys could have worked in the industry again, um, I think that that would have been completely understandable to say, "You know what? They messed up. They screwed up. They they hmm. they lost perspective. They did whatever these things they did, but they didn't do that." Ultimately, they're saying we're going to climb the slow climb, the slow grind towards the center of the galaxy of trying to build back our player base. Well, like, I admire them for that. The potential is almost unlimited. What they've got is a framework here, and if we will give them the time that they need to build the game that they want to build and give them the benefit of the doubt that they weren't trying to intentionally screw us or they made a mistake and now they're trying to make it good, you know, you can't fix that overnight. I think... Um, I'll say this, and we can then we can move on. But it it seems to me that when you're when you've already released your game, you're already charging sixty bucks for it. Um, it already didn't have a lot of the things that people expected it to have, aka due to all the promises. You sort of lost your right to have the benefit of the doubt, in my opinion. Wow, that's just my, well. I mean, that's just it's the tr- that's the way I feel about wow. it. Wow, I, I really do. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to say it's it's vindictive, but this is the this is the feeling that I get from a lot of people in the community where um, there were a lot of people that were very trusting of them initially, and they feel betrayed, and that's the that's the impression that I get. And that uh, brings me to, I think, an interesting way to close this out. It's a okay. sentiment that I don't necessarily agree with, but my brother found a, uh, a comment on a subreddit, the No Man's Sky subreddit, mm-hmm. um, in response to the question, is No Man's Sky worth playing now that the expansion is out? The response is, absolutely not. It's still a grind fest through badly done, procedurally generated pointlessness. If you're just into base building, that part is somewhat okay. The subreddit is in love again because they got dumped by their crappy ex, and now he claims he's sorry and wants to get back together. It's not a healthy relationship. Wow. So, well, I, I found that well, kind of funny. We'll leave it at that yeah. and move on. Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs> this is the Gaming Meta. News and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. Okay, so uh, I've got a Gaming Meta segment. The Gaming Meta. The Gaming Meta. Um, and there were a couple of events in gaming that I'd like to talk about recently. Um the first is the Game Awards, and yes, that is the name. It's called the Game Awards. I remember that from last year. Mm-hmm. Yes, they're back. This is the 2016 version. Um, it's an interesting awards show. I don't know if y'all had a chance to watch any of it. I did not, unfortunately. Um, I, I caught clips, and I went back, and I, I looked through some of it. They still have a lot of kinks to work out, but um, all in all, I think it's a, it was actually a pretty good show. So what they did was they had some pretty cool things, like uh, Mick Gordon, the composer for the Doom soundtrack. Mm-hmm. He performed um, pieces from the soundtrack live. Hey. Which was really cool. Uh, the Doom Doom music did actually win uh, the best soundtrack award, oh, well, which it it deserved it. I mean, it was the it music was, good, was yeah. great. Um, it was nominated for uh, best overall game. It did not win. It did win best action game. Was it action or FPS? I think action. It was beat up by No Man's Sky. No, um, <laughs> Overwatch actually won Game of the Year. Really? Okay. Which is another game which makes sense to me. I mean, yeah. I've only I played a little bit of it. It's not really my cup of tea either, mm-hmm. but I totally understand why it won. It's oh, a very yeah, polished yeah. game. It's made a huge splash. It's made a huge, yeah, very popular. Mm-hmm. Um, Pokemon Go, I believe, won Best Mobile Game. There are a few other that highlights. Sense, yeah. um, some of the things that I thought they did kind of a little a little strangely some of the categories they never even bothered to read off nominees they just mm-hmm. kind of just announced a winner mm-hmm. so it, it has these little kinks where it's almost not it's like sort of an award show sort of like a giant you know one big ad for for multiple multiple <laughs> games and, and and that was the other part i wanted to talk about related to it as well is that they they debuted mm-hmm. um trailers for some yeah, new games I, I remember they said when they first yeah. started they wanted to make it an event that wasn't just an award show but also kind of an industry look ahead mm-hmm. event where they want to you know feature new debut trailers and mm-hmm. that sort of thing and and so a couple of these um the new legend of zelda breath of the wild trailer mm-hmm. came out and it was actually pretty neat uh they showed essentially the the sort of like a 
uh, like this this serene town and the village and the surrounding area and like the fields mm. and um, and then of course everything kind of descends into this sort of chaos apocalyptic type deal. Um, there's also this mysterious character that was next to uh, Link. Which I thought was just Zelda, but apparently now people are saying, "Oh, who is that? It could be anyone." And they're yeah. talking about they're like, "I, I was is thinking it Zelda. Is it Linkle? Is it blah blah blah?" I was I'm thinking like, Zelda, but we'll see. I, I think people are are sort of um, reaching here. <laughs> I mean, how is it not Zelda? Is my thought, but okay, maybe it's not. It's I don't the know. The female Link that we've been waiting for for a long time. Well, we you mean Linkle? That's mm-hmm. already been inside the. Oh uh, well, no, the fem- like he's talking playable female Link, not. No, no, they already said that's not going to happen mm-hmm. because why would it? That's silly. But maybe they're going to surprise us. No, I'm kidding. No, uh, but I, they do have a, a playable female Link. It's Linkle, and she's playable in the uh, what is Hyrule, it Warriors. Called? Hyrule Warriors. Yeah. yeah, that character exists, but <laughs> I don't understand why that character would be in this game. It doesn't make any sense. I guess it, I guess she could, but so you're I saying know. it's just the male character Zelda? Okay, I'm so confused now. I'm <laughs> what so if confused. Zelda was a guy? <laughs> no, um, Zelda so, was a girl. That's what it was. That's what it was. <laughs> so they that. I mean, it's of course a teaser trailer, but I, I mean, my initial thoughts were I want to play this game. Yeah. I mean, that was yeah. that's what I thought. Oh, absolutely. It was interesting to see, like, you know, you sort of mentioned it descended into chaos. I was curious because the first time I saw it, I was actually thinking, it's like, oh, they're showing there's more civilization than it appeared mm-hmm. in the early demos they were showing. But then it's also quite possible that what they were showing was the before of the apocalypse that you're playing after. I'm pretty sure that's what it is because. Mm. Uh, they showed us all the pretty pretty and then they showed us the the destruction mm-hmm. and you know what's cool i love a beautiful apocalypse i just I, that that genre to me is is one of my favorites we've role played in that genre we've uh, you know we've talked about some of my favorite games are in that genre uh, odyssey to the west enslaved odyssey yeah. to the west yeah. still my all-time favorite game um, you could argue twilight i think twilight princess to me Yes. felt that way as well. There was there was these, these hints of not only did the world kind of you have these like the shadow creatures that were coming in and all that mm-hmm. kind of element to it, but also some of the places that you went had this element of there was lost technology. Yes. Like the whole Sky Temple, I think yes. it was, um, had a lot of little things in there. I think that, that all the Legend of Zelda's have that hint yeah. that there was a great civilization that came before. There was a great fall of that civilization. Call it an apocalypse mm-hmm. if you want, and that basically mm-hmm. nature or whatever recovered, and a new civilization has emerged. In that sense, all the Zeldas are beautiful apocalypses. Mm-hmm. But this one, I think, is going for it. You know what I mean? I think it's it's absolutely owning that that's what it is and really showing it. And I'm excited about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Looked really cool. And the other trailer that they showed that, that got a lot of attention um, was Death Stranding, which is Hideo Kojima's new game. Um, he showed the first trailer, what was it, six months ago? Was it at E3, right? So it would have been like in May? I think you're right. I'm if, you didn't, if you didn't see it, uh, run your bathtub full of coffee <laughs> and then beat yourself unconscious with a baby doll. That's pretty much it. Yes. No, the, the trailer sprinkle is... Sprinkle some dead crabs around. Yeah, that works. Yes. <laughs> the trailer is insane. For sure, it doesn't, literally, it doesn't uh, make it. It feels like it doesn't really make any sense. That's because it um, doesn't. <laughs> but it's also interesting. Like I, I watched it and I and I had an immediate reaction to it. Um, and me too, uh, mm-hmm. but probably not the same one. Well, no, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm not going to go out on a limb and say and because I think some people are, have jumped to conclusions one way or the other. We don't know anything about this game yet. Mm-hmm. This this game, the game itself, could be garbage or it could be great. Mm-hmm. But this trailer doesn't tell us anything about that game. So it tells us that there's some sort of story going on, but we don't know if this is this presentation is even how the game it's, the game story itself is going to be presented. So is it time for some reckless speculation? Well, because I think I think I, think I, I know it. I, I think it's pretty obvious, actually. I I think again we're in the in, in apocalypse territory. Oh well, some kind of sure sure some kind of alien invasion has occurred, and they. He's basically stolen the the black ink from uh, X Files, if you remember that one, uh, that manifests itself in, in tentacles of some kind and takes over humans. So you've got these flesh walking human zombie things, and then the, the the rest of the humans are trying to survive and uh, keep life going by. I'm gonna say shooting it into space. Well, funny you should mention some of that because there's been people have been examining this trailer a mm-hmm, lot because mm-hmm. that's kind of the whole point. And they found, and let me see if I can find this. I found this on Twitter, and it's actually really interesting. They compared this trailer to the first trailer. And at the exact moment, shot for shot, let's see. um, If you play the trailers next to each other, uh, the baby that Norman Reedus is holding Mm -hmm. 
at the exact second teleports from his character, and then when it comes up, uh, being held by you know Benicio del Toro's character, right, right. it's now inside that capsule. And they, he made a GIF of it, and I can show it here to y'all if you want to see what it's what it looks like. This is this is the exact the exact frame by frame moment of these. He didn't like change the shots. It's like it's at the exact second. Oh, you notice how it looks like it's so when the baby disappears from Norman, it appears yes. in the the little uh, tube. Yes, and on one side is the, the artificial the first trailer from E three, and the other one is the new. One. So interesting. Knowing Kojima's the way that he likes to do, you know. Um, Mind screw, I guess I'll say, <laughs> did not get to uh, not move away from PG, but he likes doing things like that. Um, it, that's has to be, it has to be intentional. He would have done that on purpose. Okay. So there's definitely, I think he, I think this is part of a big ad campaign, mm-hmm. obviously, to generate interest because when he when he made that first trailer, the first Death Stranding trailer, and he admitted this too when that trailer was made, that was a concept. There was not even a game that this was going to be for. That mm-hmm. was a, here's a concept for ideas that I think would be interesting to make a game about. Because of the reaction that that, that first trailer got, mm-hmm. that's what you know. Sony went ahead and said, okay, go ahead and make this game. Before, there wasn't even a game. He hadn't even thought of, like, here's what the game's going to be. He just had, I have some cool ideas in my head. I'm going to put them, I'm going to just put them down, use some CG, get people to put them down. And, the and George show Lucas of video games. <laughs> right. So it's very, it's, <laughs> yeah, that's actually, I, I think, a very fair comparison. And so um, I, I think, I think I'll, I'll save this um, to go into a bigger talk about Death Stranding because I do want that to, to feed into our meaty topic. Cool. Um, but I have a lot more thoughts related to the trailer. We can talk about that some more. But first, let's take a slight break to play a round of a couple of rounds of buy, try, or trash. Oh no! Woo. It's time for game show, where the backward compatible crew play a game show kind of game on their gaming show. What sort of crazy game show challenges in store this week on Game Show? Let's find out right now on Game Show. We've made a slight modification to the rules. We're keeping the name the same, but when we say trash now, what we mean specifically is cancel. So it's basically meaning the game's never going to be published. No one's going to get to play it. We're just canceling the project. So that's what we mean by trash now. So I'm not throwing away my copy. I am a producer saying uh, none of you are getting paid. (laughs) <laughs> and we're going to hike the price and uh, release it full, even though it's just an album. No, it means that it is just not coming out. Oh. oh. <laughs> so, buying it means that you are going to buy and own. Trying it means that you get to play it, you know, maybe once, you know, like say a rental, or even just one sit down with it to try it out and then cancel. Or trash means the project is canceled, never oh, coming out. Wow. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to start off uh, here by Try Trash cool. with uh, some new games that are released because I want to focus on new content. Hmm. Games, y'all, I haven't played because they're not out yet. Um, these are coming straight from the PlayStation Experience, which was the other big conference that came out. Straight from the PlayStation the Experience. PlayStation Experience. Doesn't it sound exciting? It doesn't. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sorry. I there, there, were some, there were some neat trailers there as well. Um, some cool game announcements. Uh, some of these games I'm sure you've heard of. So buy, try, or trash. Three games. Here mm-hmm. we go. Mm-hmm. Um, the Last Guardian. Mm-hmm. The Last Guardian, for those that may not know, this is the third game from the same developer behind Ico and Shadow of the Colossus. Right. The Last Guardian has been was announced, what, it feels like 10 years ago at this point? Yeah. Uh, just, just so you know, Jim, it's actually pronounced Eco by those who uh, care and are extremely pretentious. Well, I'm over here <laughs> eating my gyro... <laughs> talking about Ico. So, there you go. You um, must be an American. <laughs> America. <laughs> yes, so uh, first, The Last Guardian, has been, it's been a um, highly anticipated game for quite some time. Yes, it has. Uh, apparently, it's actually going to come out now. Yes, it is. I'll believe it when I see it. Uh, the next one. <laughs> the Last of Us Part 2. There, a sequel was announced. Sure, yeah. The Last of Us Part 2. Um, Ellie is now an adult. Oh, and, and stuff is now falling down even more than ever. Yes. Well, of course. Um, and then finally, Horizon Zero Dawn. Oh! This you was, son yes, of a... <laughs> this was the... Um, uh, almost like a, a some sort of a post-apocalypse with robots, and it seems like you're a tribal character. Beautiful apocalypse. Yes. Beautiful apocalypse. Another yes, beautiful apocalypse yes. game, yes. Actually, 
kind of similar in uh, in tone to uh, Lost Odyssey that you mentioned. Before, yeah, yeah, I'm no kidding. At least at least aesthetically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so that's extremely painful, but it's also very easy. Okay. Okay, I'm totally gonna buy Horizon Zero Dawn, try uh, Last Guardian, and uh, Trash Two. Oh. Trash Last of Us 2. I am. I I am. So you're going to have to justify these choices for us here. Okay. Well, um, until today, and Mm. you said it, I literally didn't know that 2 was coming out. That was news to me. Well, it was just announced yesterday, to be fair. Well, okay, <laughs> fair enough. But uh, so that that's not. I haven't invested emotionally in it. Um, that said, I have an emotional investment in Horizon Zero Dawn. I talked about it as my number one most anticipated game last year, mm-hmm. and the New Year's one in, in January, if you'll recall. Um, and so that got pushed back into 2017. So yeah, I've been now, or I will have now, been waiting for that game for over a year after having seen really great footage and that demo that I really liked. There are elements of gameplay in that that I'm very much looking forward to, like um, you know, damage uh, that, that's located on the giant robots and that sort of a thing. That said, I kind of feel like um, maybe Last Guardian is going to be a little bit more of what I really love about those other two games, and if I just wanted to... By, by the other, the other two, two, I mean, I mean Ico and... Uh, uh, the Colossus, okay. right? So if if I really needed to, after trying it, and I was just feeling the the hurt, um, I could just go load up either one of those two, and and I would be okay. Okay, but there is no substitute for Horizon Zero Dawn yet. <laughs> All right, are y'all big uh, Marvel versus Capcom fans? You remember playing these back in the day? Marvel uh, versus Capcom. Never, never played very Fighting much. Game series. Just because I'm not great at fighters, and I never had the consoles that would run that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm I'm interested in kind of like a uh, I, I I'm a sucker for mashups. This was so, also announced uh, Marvel vs. Capcom crossovers. Infinite. Infinite. Mm-hmm. It is the new game in the series. Oh really? So um, they. So what, so they what happens trailer. after Infinite then? I don't. Not know. nothing. This is nothing. just this is this is the the nothing. Alpha and the Omega. That's it. That's <laughs> um, it. All the games at forever are going away. <laughs> And because of this, I wanted to sort of make a, a fighting game themed by Try Trash. Oh, very nice. So, Chris, by Try Trash, Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. Okay. The new Super Smash Brothers that for sure is going to be on the Switch because it always is, mm. and they want to sell units. Mm-hmm. Um, or Street Fighter VI. Okay. Which is coming as well. Gotcha. Um... He's going to buy Street Fighter. <laughs> no. Uh, I'm probably going to trash Street Fighter, actually. Uh, I'm not that big a Street Fighter fan. When was um, the last, what was the last Street Fighter that you played? Have you played five yet? I've played four. I haven't played five. Hmm. Um, when was the last Street Fight you were actually in? Uh, I've not been in a Street Fight. Oh, man. I'm, I'm happy to say. Well, you know, I, <laughs> the first two rules are I can't talk about it, so. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, no, that's Fight Club. Mm. Um, crap. <laughs> it's, it's Street Fight Club. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so, yeah, trash, trash, trash Street Fighter Six. Um, if for no other reason than because I can Try uh, Marvel vs. Capcom, okay. um, and that has a lot of Street Fighter characters in it. Mm. Um, so if I want a little dose of Street Fighter, that's going to give it to me. But the obvious buy for me is the new Smash Brothers because I always buy Smash Brothers and I always play a ton of Smash Brothers and I always look forward to Smash Brothers. It's, it's, mm. it's Smash Bros. So all right, Chris, you had one. Uh, yeah, you'd like mm-hmm. to give us. Okay, so I've actually got uh, hypothetical questions. These are uh, games that have not been announced. Okay, um, but just kind of like if they were to be announced, uh, how would you guys react? All right. So I've actually designed one for you, Jim, and sure. I designed one for Doc. So, Jim, your hypothetical: buy, try, or trash. A new isometric Fallout from the original creators. Ooh, we're talking HD. You know, mm-hmm. probably two point five D, uh, but isometric classic Fallout. Um, Kojima developing a new Metal Gear independently. Oh, wait a minute. Define independently. Uh, like Kojima Productions, the oh, studio. Okay. So he's not like by himself making Right, no, he, he has reacquired the rights to Metal Gear. What, what, what is his budget? Um, <laughs> whatever Kojima Con- Productions can conjure up. So anything. Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. Um, and then this one, this one might have been the one that like it, uh, it was kind of throwaway, but uh-huh. I think it could still be interesting. Um, a reinvention of Mass Effect with the product or the development team of your choice. If you could, like, they Bioware huh. comes to you and says, "We want to do this thing called Mass Effect." Uh, how would you? How do you want to do it? It's like a reimagining, hmm. Re- reinvention. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. That's a great question. So the the interesting thing for that for me was that I'm actually not a Mass Effect fan. Mm-hmm. I, I was actually, I played the first one. Um, I, I know I've gone. I, I know I've talked at length before about my dis- dislike of the new Bioware 
the direction they've gone as a company. Mm -hmm. um, so I won't go into all of that. Uh, since I used to be such a huge fan, it was it's probably the biggest turnaround that I've ever had for a game company. Mm -hmm. um, I went from they were my favorite gaming company to I just I don't even look at anything that they do anymore. Mm. That's why I posed the question. Right. Mm. So I could see, but I, but the concept behind Mass Effect I think is interesting, and um, it could have been, hey, this is a new. Knights of the Old Republic style game, but without the Star Wars IP, so they can just have a little bit more freedom. Mm -hmm. They're not they're not bound to LucasArts and all that. So I'm intrigued enough about this to put this as my uh, try. Okay. Um, in terms of who I would want to to develop this, I actually would want to go back and look at some of the older developers behind um, the original Baldur's Gate, Baldur's Gate Two, um, some of the team that worked on Knights of the Old Republic, the first one. Mm -hmm. um, so possibly this project would, I would say, arguably, would be handed off mostly to Obsidian, okay, um, not to Bioware. So that might help as well. Gotcha. Um, for my um, buy, I'm going to have to say the, the Metal Gear Solid 6 okay. with Kojima. Infinite budget Kojima. Um, <laughs> this is, I mean, this is, how could Hugs you, were in fantasy. How, this isn't even my final four. Yeah, how could, how could you possibly not... <laughs> Can you just look? Even if, <laughs> even if you hate Metal Gear Solid, even if you you just—I mean, not hate it, but even if you just you're not that interested in it, and you're like, I don't really care about this series. If if that would be me, right? But if but if you're like, because you think Kojima's kind of kind of nuts. But if some if, if you knew that Kojima, I don't think he's nuts. I think he's brilliant. Right. I think he's a hack. Right. There's a difference. But, mm. but regardless, if you knew that like some mil some billionaire was like just said, hey, here you go, Kojima, infinite budget, make this game. Wouldn't you be interested enough to want to play it? I mean. Because you don't know what's going to happen. I'll catch the Let's Play. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll buy the game so you can come over and, and watch me play it. Sounds good. Um, and then, of course, I, I, by process of elimination, I will have to trash the new isometric Fallout. Um, a lot of that, I think, is because I've sort of seen what that might be with the new Wasteland games. I was going to say. Yeah, and while they're interesting, um, I'm not as... I, I, I think I'm at a point where I'm sort of beyond that type of game, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. I mean, I feel like if I was younger, I would totally be into it, but I just don't feel like I have the time to dedicate mm -hmm. to a game like that. Um, I'd still, if it came out, I certainly would play it. I'm not going to say I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. But of these three choices, that's the one I'm going to have to trash. Okay. okay. Wow. So. All right, Doc, now you're hypothetical. An idealized to No Man's Sky. No Man's Sky, where you want it to be, not where it is. Okay. Yeah, gotcha. Wow. Um, a Middle Earth exploration game. Ooh! Uh, and Minecraft 2 with at least three key features of your choosing. Oh, you son of a... <laughs> uh, what's the, what's the, the subtitle for that? Minecraft 2, the quest for more blocks. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so is this Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings, or is this uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings? Because they are distinctly different. Which would you prefer? Which would I prefer? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, this is going to get me in so much trouble. From a gamification standpoint, Peter Jackson. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Now, from a narrative standpoint and all other ways, uh, Tolkien's mm. is, in my opinion, superior, but they could never make those films mm -hmm. or, or games. Mm -hmm. No, uh, I, I hear you. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. So and we're talking about games, so, yeah. I am going to have to trash. Oh, man, this is so difficult. I, yi, yi. <laughs> I almost can't say the words. <laughs> I'm going to trash Minecraft. Mm. I am. I'm going to trash Minecraft. I'm going to um, buy the idealized No Man's Sky, and I am going to try um, Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings, mm. the open world experience. Huh. Okay. I, I, I went retro with mine, actually. So what we have is a modern remake. Okay, so it's a modern remake but done with the classic games in mind. Okay, so it's, okay. it's literally like a reskin, like was recently done with uh, Metroid 2, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So the original Metroid, the uh, Castlevania of your choice, okay? Okay. Or the Mega Man of your choice. Huh. And so what is the... So the reskin would... So I... See, for me, Metroid, I've already played it because mm -hmm. they did... They did Zero Mission already, and that was like the, that was that reskin like you're talking about. Sure, yeah. So I think that's already been done. Okay. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't have that redone. 
so I can probably just eliminate that. Sounds good. Um, and we, I mean, this could be in like a 3D space or anything like that. If oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's different then. Okay. Hmm. So it's, it's a reimagining of those original things. Okay, interesting. Hmm. This is pretty hard then. Okay. Yeah, I meant um, it to be. So right. This would be like Metroid Zero West mission. Yeah, right. for me, it's the most yes. Zero. Well, for me, this would be <laughs> since since they already did Zero Mission, which was like a hey, what if we did a SNES version of the NES Metroid? Which sure, is what yeah. that was. It was great, but instead, I would make this a GameCube. Hey, what if, what if I did a Metroid Prime with the original Metroid? Correct. And I would want to play that. I mean, heck yeah. So I'm gonna. I, I can't trash that. I'm gonna okay. put that on can't trash. I gotta. <laughs> figure this out. That's, that's not enough. So, all right, so, not enough. so Mega Man, um, I'm going to go with the best Mega Man, and everyone agrees this is the best, and if they don't, they're wrong. Mega two. Man 3. Oh. Mega Man 3. <laughs> that's the best. Not 2. 3. Because 3 had the bigger levels. <laughs> levels in Mega Man 2 are too short. Okay, so... Um, plus you have Rush in 3. You've got a dog. <laughs> it's a robot dog. Come on, people. <laughs> um, anyway. It's hard to argue with robot yeah, dogs. Robot dogs, mm. come on. Um, so I, I'm going to go with Mega Man 3. Um... As you try or you buy. But see, here's the problem with that one, though. It's like, what would they do for the new version? Because I don't think Mega Man would really work in, in a 3D space. Mm-hmm. Um, Did they try it once? Yes. Well, no, they have, like Mega Man Legends. Mm-hmm. But I didn't like the Legends series. I didn't feel like it worked. Uh-huh. And and then if we're talking about just making it you know, like a, like a SNES version, well, we've seen that in Mega Man X, and I actually preferred greatly the gameplay and the style of the NES version. So, honestly, I think I might have to trash that one on, wow. the, on, the, on the one reason being, I don't think you can improve on it. I think it's like that's... like it, it, You can change it. You can make it different. But I don't think it would necessarily be better. Mm-hmm. So, I say, I say trash that concept entirely. So, I'm going to buy um, the Metroid, which would be the GameCube um, Metroid Prime, but it would be Metroid Prime Zero Mission, um, just because I love the Metroid Prime series as well, and I think it would be interesting to see the original sort of reimagined in that style. And then for Castlevania, I'm going to try that one, and that's going to be a um, a Symphony of the Night reimagining of Castlevania Three, which uh, Dracula's Curse, which is a very interesting um, NES game mm-hmm. where you it had a lot of it had a lot of um, well, let me take that back. Could do no, you know what? I'm going to go instead. With two, with Castlevania two, and the reason why I'll, I'll say this: Castlevania two had a lot of um, potential, but I think it was actually not a very good game. Mm. Even though it introduced a lot of really interesting stuff, like you were you were kind of in an open world space. It was another one of those that kind of experimented mm. with open world. Um, you had the day night cycle. You had all these these um, RPG elements that were added to it. Mm-hmm. But it did like everything didn't really work. It was like a mashup, and mm-hmm. it, and instead of instead of like your your beautiful blended mashed potatoes, it was like this lumpy mess just on your plate, and you're just like, how do I even approach and try to eat this? <laughs> so, I want the perfectly blended Castlevania too, because I think it had a lot of a, a shot at redemption. Yeah, that makes yes. sense. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try that one. Maybe this will be a less terrible night for a curse. Oh, there yes. you go. <laughs> Meaty topic of discussion. I wanted to kind of return to Death Stranding because I think this will lead us into what I want our meaty topic to be about, what I want us to discuss. And when I saw this trailer, and I understand the reaction from from some people, Doc included, who looked at this and said, this is just hacky nonsense. Because Dude, what is it weird. really? Yeah, it's it's weird. It doesn't really seem to have any real, much much meaning to it. I mean, is it is, is there really depth there? Well, I don't know. I don't think there was enough there to even No, say. I think it was derivative. Uh, sure. I mean, there, there were a lot of things in there that they were in- that he was intentionally trying to excite people. Yeah. But it, there wasn't, I don't think there was any real um, there wasn't any meat there. No, there was he, was, he really was evoking there. stuff that we went, oh, okay, that's like in this, and that's like yes. in that, and Precisely. that's like in this. Precisely. Sure. And so, but what I think is interesting about this trailer, it did a couple of things that I think that game trailers have not done. And so I think it, we have a couple of, if not firsts, uh, the first notable time that, I, that we've seen wow, this. that's so, a bold statement. a couple of things here. One, this is the, this is the first time in both trailers so far of, of Death Stranding have been like this. We have no idea of what the gameplay for 
is going to be. That's mm-hmm. correct. We don't know, is this a stealth game? Is this an action game? Is this an FPS? Mm-hmm. Um, is it a mixture of all of them? Is this just a story-driven game where you're making choices? So not to sidetrack us too much, but I think Kojima has said something along the lines of it's going to be an open-world action game, but the way he defines action is the same way. He, he compared it to when Metal Gear Solid first came out, the first one, yeah. that he, it was called an action game at the time because the stealth, stealth genre wasn't really a thing. Yeah. So we would call it a stealth game today, but it was called an action game back then. Um, right, and so actually, and he's he had, kind of figuring out. And he had a weird is... name for it, too. He, mm-hmm. I think it's uh, originally he called it a tactical espionage mm-hmm. or something like that. I remember that. Uh, so, I mean, it was tactical, it was tactical espionage a- action, Metal yeah. Gear Solid. Right. Now, so, see, I, I got and, the impression from the second trailer, the yeah. new one, that the, the guy who was carrying the canister mm-hmm. was the player character. And part of that had to do with just the way that it was animated, because it was animated in a walking sequence, not like a walking sequence would be animated. Uh, for a video, right. but like a a player character repeating the walk. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? And the way that he stopped and the way he turned around, all that, it felt like it was player controlled. I agree. But the, but but we just don't know. We don't I know. think there's there's so many unanswered questions here. And even when he says, like you were saying, you know, action, what does mm-hmm. that mean? Because right. it could mean a lot. There's a lot of different directions they can go with it. And even a game like Snatcher that I played from his that is a, a very interesting game. Um, one could argue that's an action game. One could argue that's a visual novel. I mean, it's like it skirts both mm-hmm. uh, boundaries. So we really don't know enough about the gameplay. Even if you say action, that's too broad to really yeah. say we know about the gameplay. Right. Um, I'm not worried about the, him knowing the word action. I'm knowing. I'm worried about him knowing the word cut. No, no, no. It's not. <laughs> no, not, not about that. I mean, I'm, I'm saying. I think it's. Should I did there? Right. Yes, yeah. But I think it's the first trailer that we've seen that that leaves us with it's not really being sold at all on on, on gameplay. gameplay. It's not. It's being. It's the idea is this is a a. Celebrity, I guess you could say, like a, a person that has a you know an auteur. We should we can say a gaming auteur, just like in film, an auteur. Oh, you went there. I am. I'm going there. Wow, you're going there. Now, when I say that, I'm not making a judgment call on him as a. Actually, I completely designer. agree. With right, I am not making a judgment call. I'm I saying completely right. Agree with you. you see what I'm saying? Like, yeah. You you can not like him, but still say that he's on on our tour. Absolutely. Right, and that's where I'm getting. Same thing with. Oh, there's yeah. plenty of directors that I would call them auteurs, even if I don't like well, their work. You could you could watch a, a new film come out and be like, dude, that's totally a Tarantino. Film. Yes. Mm-hmm. And you just know it, yes. even if it didn't say it. And and even regardless of whether you like Tarantino's films or not, you, you still have it. to say that. Yes. And that's where I think I agree. Kojima, and that's something that I think is that he is doing that is that is different because there's not. There's not as many like that in, in gaming, whereas that has been a standard in film since prob- probably around the 70s. That's true. I mean, not to say that it hadn't happened before that, mm. but it's been a standard in, in film since around the 70s. Yeah, that was going to be my counter-argument, actually, is that yes. film's been doing that for a long time. Right. I'd say probably the closest thing we have to that in gaming so far, um, well, we, I'm not saying we, we, we occasionally have a few auteurs, yes. but I think the closest thing to that is just studios. Mm-hmm. Studios have very particular styles. Right, and that's, but that's what I'm saying. This is, mm-hmm. a, this, this is becoming, we're seeing a shift yeah. towards the, the individual. And like you see, see someone like, say, uh, you know, Ken Levine has... A voice as well. Yeah, I think there's yeah. other there's other creators that you can say have a voice mm-hmm. that you could argue are our tours. Um, you know, even like e- even like Miyamoto. You yeah, could, no, I would argue. I, I yeah. would say yes, but um, this is still a rarer thing, and I feel like it's becoming more and more. It's it's becoming more and more common. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to point out on this is that if you watch, and I asked y'all when you watch this trailer to make sure you go all the way to the end and see the final shot. What I what I noticed at the end was. You see Hideo Kojima's name above the title of the game, yeah. and then underneath it, you see two actors, mm-hmm. Norman Reedus and Mads Mikkelsen. Right. And what I found very interesting is this presentation is like a film trailer. Mm-hmm. Um, you see the name of the director, in this uh-huh. case Kojima, and you also see actors right. that are that are being given billing. Like, why why should I go see the, this new film that's out? Well, it's directed by so and so. Oh, it's got these two really great actors in it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, this is being presented like a film. Yeah, it is. and it's being sold on this concept of. And if you noticed from the trailer, I don't know if you all saw the uh, the Game Awards version of it, where you could hear the audience's reaction. Uh huh. Because I did it, the one I yeah, made yeah. to you. So you when you heard their reaction when they saw Mads Mikkelsen as the villain when he took off his, his right. face and you could you could tell who he was because of the way the, the, the facial motion capture is actually really is really good. Very good. So you can totally tell who it is. And um, Thank you, LA Noir, for breaking that yes. <laughs> ice for us. Um, and 
he, he looks like Matt Mickelson, and, and the crowd just erupts. They, they love it. And it's, that was the same reaction from the E3 trailer with Norman Reedus, because mm-hmm. people love that Norman Reedus now because of The Walking Dead and mm-hmm. his character in The Walking Dead. Oh, that was funny about so, the E3 trailers, that like they cut to the audience after that trailer, yes. and most of them were like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Why? Right. Well, but that's the reaction that he's going for. And yeah, so, yeah. so there's that element of it. And so I, I think that this is something that we're seeing a transition, a shift in gaming, mm-hmm. from this focus on... What what are you doing? What's the play? Like basically the what what is the interact interaction that you're having? Like what are you going to do? Mm-hmm. Tell me what I'm going to do. And instead, it's almost to the point where it's not even the story. It's like the experience. And you, you see where I'm going with this? Yeah, interesting parallel. Yeah. Um, so there's a there's a radio show I listen to uh, locally, the Ben and the Skin Show. Mm. And it's a sports talk radio show. Um, but one of the hosts, Ben, um, is a sales guy, and he's really into advertising and stuff like that. And so he likes to talk a lot about Nike because it's one of his favorite brands. Uh-huh. Um, and what Nike sort of they, – they broke the mold a little bit because shoe advertising used to be very feature-focused. It used to be it's made of this, and it has these features. And like, oh, the way we do these ridges, you know, like makes it whatever. Um, Nike, their advertising – was selling an emotion. It was yes. Yeah. Um, yes. it was selling uh, what the shoe is going to do for you. An experience. An experience. Yes. Yeah. And I think this is a trend that we're starting to see with gaming. Yes. Um, it's and that's let, exactly yeah, where I'm going. It, with the games this. used to be sold on. Um, it's got these mechanics. It's got these features. And like, oh, this time you're going to be able to fight one million troops. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and, and who is the former being sold to in both instances? Nerds. Nerd, like the shoe nerd, the person that's mm. like, what is, what is exact? Tell me what it's going to do. Tell me how it's going to benefit oh, me. Tell gotcha. me the, the practicality. Gotcha. Okay, gotcha. And the same thing with the game. It's like, what am I going to do? Mm. Like, give me some specifics, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. As, and, and then, as opposed to the experience, the feeling, it becomes, it's opening it up to a broader base. Mm-hmm. I think is another part. Makes of it Makes sense too. to me. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not saying that one is better than the other either, mm-hmm. by the way. Mm-hmm. It is an interesting thing, though, that we sort of see a parallel where the younger an industry is, the more it's trying to kind of sell the technicalities, and then the more it becomes more widespread, more right. mainstream, um, is when they start doing the appeals to emotion. That actually makes like a that. lot of sense if you and, think about it. I mean, you could draw some parallels. We, we, we don't want to get too off track, but we can draw some parallels to um, how news and social media and stuff is more emotional reactions to things than it is about rational arguments about um, objective stuff. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. So I, this is this is the shift that I think that we're seeing in games, and I think it's been happening for a while now, but it's been gradual. Um, this shift, to, and a lot of it has been a talk of games becoming more cinematic, um, taking a lot of cues from film, which is true, mm-hmm. but we're also seeing this move towards um, the auteur's vision mm-hmm. and... The experience. What am I going to feel when I play this game? What sort of experience am I going to get? Yeah. And not just what sort of challenge will I get, mm-hmm. because that's more, that's the doing. Like, how hard is it going to be? Um, how fun is it going to be? That kind of thing. This is more, um, in addition to that, what, what will I be experiencing? Mm-hmm. And this is something that, um, as, as part of that, and I think it's all, all sort of built into it, there's this expectation from the designer when they're, make, when they're putting these games together. You're going to exp- have a complete experience with this game. They're not expecting you to get into the game to die 50 times on level 1. Right. And n- nor will there be a level 1, by the way. Mm-hmm. But die 50 times on level 1 and be like, well, I can't, be, I can't play this game. I'm going to have to return it or I'm going to have to, like... Get, get a friend of mine to beat this part for me because I can't beat it because it's too hard. Mm-hmm. They're expecting everyone to get through the game. Like in uh, when I talked about Watch Dogs 2 earlier, some of the missions are frustrating f- in certain ways, um, usually because the controls are lacking in certain ways, mm-hmm. but you will win. Like it's like you're expected to win because they want you to get through the game and experience the entire story mm-hmm. and also and they want to whatever whatever they think their message is, regardless of whether it's put together well or not, mm-hmm. they want you to to get that message. I would I would kind of counter that point though with well I wouldn't counter it I would add a caveat that mm-hmm. I think the developers want you to finish the game. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. But at the same time, I think like 80 percent of players don't. Um, and so I think that in a way, like I would say sort of like the two biggest trends, because people talk a lot, and we've been talking a lot about moving toward more cinematic games, right? Um, almost more movie-like experiences. Um, I think that we're going to start to see like a little bit of a divergence between the sort of short, complete experiences 
that people can get through easily and quickly and completely. Um, and then the other trend is more like open world, open ended, kind of make your own play yeah. sorts of things. Yeah. I can see um, that, yeah. And so it's kind of like the, for the people who are willing to put the time into it, we have the things that like are maybe even directionless, that it's kind mm-hmm. of like, you know, make your own fun for as long as you want. And then there's the, we're going to give you a very specific experience. And even in those open world games, though, mm-hmm. you're still having that. It's still a focus on the experience mm-hmm. because when you play something like The Witcher Three or uh, Grand Theft Auto, mm-hmm. um, they put so much time into creating the world so that it feels alive, um, so that when you're in the world, you you feel like you're a part of the world. Mm-hmm. And so it's, this is a, a big focus of these open world games that I think is something that we would not have seen in an earlier period of gaming, mm-hmm. like the town, say in Zelda Two that we talked about earlier. The towns were just, you go to the town so that you can um, restore your health mm-hmm. or get, like, a little bit of information from someone. It's a practical reason that you go to town. Right. You're not, but in, in say, like, if you're playing a game like Witcher 3 or, like, Skyrim yep. or um, Grand Theft Auto or something, you're going to the town to have an experience. You're going to the town to to take in, you know, this, uh, the people and the culture and, and That's correct. that kind of thing. So it's very it's very different from what we had yeah. seen earlier in games. Mm-hmm. One of the most significant things about playing The Witcher for me mm. was that when I went into a new town, it felt like a different town. Yeah. Uh, when they went into a new island or something, I was like, "Whoa, this is this is obviously inspired by Viking culture." Whereas where I was before felt a little bit more British, you know. Or, mm. or and and I never got that in Skyrim. Everywhere I went in Skyrim, oh, I agree. felt like it was. I don't think Skyrim a cut and paste town. Yeah, I don't think Skyrim successfully. Um, was successfully built that element of an open open world gaming. Right. That being said, I don't think I do think that they were trying to go in that direction. Yeah. It's just that I just don't think it was as to successful. To be fair, Elder Scrolls uh, Elder Scrolls Online I think succeeds more on that. Mm-hmm. Now I have not played it, but I've, I've watched some uh, gameplay of it. Uh, whereas when you walk into the the Skyrim portion of that, um, it feels like more Skyrim than uh, other other parts. You know what I mean? So the countries, the regions are more discreet in that sense. Mm. So if you if you play Skyrim and you're a huge fan of the series, you're going to get that. Uh, Skyrim's the only entry that I've really played personally. I've had roommates who've played it, and so I've known the lore. But um, I, I think that whenever you're designing, you have to design around that idea, that understanding. Um, am, am I building a world, or am I building part of a world mm. with this entry? Mm. That's you know a good I point. Mean? I mean, then it's you know, kind of compare it to my more sort of like small, complete cinematic experience versus that open world, open-ended, yeah, world-building experience. exactly right. Um, the, the difference is, like you said, you're building a world or you're building a, like a story, a character. Mm-hmm. Like the, a story that centers around a character, maybe a small group of characters, an ensemble, whatever right. you might have. Yeah. Um, but right, yeah, like with Until Dawn that I had talked right. about a few weeks ago. Um, no matter how much you may want to leave Skyrim and get away from the ice and go take a vacation, um, you know, go to elsewhere or something and mm-hmm. have a nice, you know, beach vacation... You can't. Mm-hmm. It's impossible. Uh, that's just not built into the game. And so there are limitations within the context of the framework of the narrative, which makes sense. Mm-hmm. That's not a complaint. It's just part of the reality of what you're creating when you build that world. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, if you look at Elder Scrolls Online, the whole thing, you can do that. You can say, I'm not, I'm not going to spend time in this region. I'm going to go somewhere else. The other element of it, the not just the mystery, because I think, I think – to go back to the Death Stranding and mention kind of what I think this trailer also is kind of bringing to to games, not just that f- focusing on trying to sell on the feeling and the emotion and all that and the experience of the game, um, but also the cast and the importance of actors. Mm-hmm. And this is something that has come into play in the animation industry as well. It's a somewhat recent phenomenon mm-hmm. where um, animated films were sold based on originally the story... And of course the characters and all that, but not the actors. Mm-hmm. And it became they started they started picking voice actors that were actually well known actors mm-hmm. on purpose um, in order to help sell the film. So that's something that is starting to happen in games too mm-hmm. now. And especially now that we can we have the ability to have ultra realistic performances, right? Right. Whereas before we we did it. Correct. Um, and this is this is. Almost something that I'm a little concerned about mm-hmm. because it's also something that I'm actually not a fan of in the animation industry either, to be perfectly honest. Um, I'm a little bit worried by this because when you have someone that is so accomplished at, say, voice acting, doing character work, mm-hmm. you don't necessarily need 
to find an actor to play that role. One of the benefits of animation, or in this case games, is that you can have someone that looks nothing like the character that you want them to look like, mm-hmm. but they're portraying this very different character. Or you can have someone that um, can do a weird voice, or like a, a strange voice, mm-hmm. and that voice is perfect for the character. You don't need to go out and find um, somebody like a Matt Mickelson. Yeah, sure. You can find like a, you know, a random person that can do a similar style voice. Mm-hmm. Um, but regardless of what I think, I mean, we're, we're, we're going in this direction. I'm kind of curious, too, to yeah. see, because right now, like, the, the sort of selling point with bringing real actors into, or I say real actors, quote-unquote, right. um, bringing them into games is that they're well-known for, like, TV and film. I'm curious if at some point we're going to get to a point where you start having the reverse, where someone who acts for games um, becomes popular enough to start appearing on TV and film. Well, we have a little bit, right? I mean, David Hayter has, has gotten some roles um, just based on his voice acting work in... Miller Solid. Mm-hmm. He's also done some writing and stuff like that, yeah. too. Um, and some production. Uh, another one, uh, you know, another recent example of an actor appearing in a game is um, Call of Duty Infinite Warfare. Um, I forget his name, but the guy who plays Jon Snow uh, played the villain in that game. Um, from all accounts, that was a less successful um, yeah. feature. Uh, although, you know, even, I mean, that same series, Call of Duty, used, um, oh, what's his name? House of Cards. Kevin Spacey. Yeah, Kevin Spacey. Yeah. So, I mean, they had Kevin Spacey in before, and I'm not sure exactly how that turned out. It was like kind of a first for the series when they featured him. Um, and so, I mean, sometimes it really does depend on the game and, you know, if they actually take advantage of these people's skills or if it really is just kind of like, uh, like you said, the billing. It's like, hey, this game features so-and-so, you know, and um, I think that for Call of Duty, it made sense to have, um, well, you know, a Game of Thrones right. crossover, so to speak, because it's... The same sort of audience. Well, what, what I'm getting at that with that is not necessarily who they're picking or, or how well it's done. It's mm-hmm. more this concept of performance. Mm-hmm. Like, the characters in the game are not just mouthpieces for the writing crew, mm-hmm. but they're actors that are performing it. Like, it, there's this extra level that is, there's extra, this extra layer that is being added to games mm-hmm. where, um, just like if you're reading a book, um, all these, all the characters are. It's just whatever, whatever the writer wanted them to be. That's exactly that's what you're getting. There's right. no extra level of interpretation. Mm-hmm. But when you add in actors, you add in the performance, and you and you, we're, even though we've had voice actors before, and it, it already kind of gave gave it that level. We're going even farther with things like facial motion capture, and full motion, full body motion capture, where this is becoming performance art. It's mm-hmm. be, it is a performance now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it adds this extra extra layer to games that we didn't have before. And it, I think, in a way, it can kind of make or break the game, too. Um, to use, you know, I talked a little bit last time about Steins Gate, or a couple of times ago. And um, in that one, it's a visual novel. It's very text-heavy, but it's actually also fully voice-acted. Yeah. Um, granted, it's in Japanese. Um, so, like, you know, if you've watched enough anime and stuff like that, you can start to pick up on, like, you know, what different inflections kind of imply. Um, to the lay person, it might not mean anything just because it's like, oh, yeah, it's another foreign language. I don't understand any of it. Um, but what was interesting is that when they did the anime adaptation of it, they used the same voice cast. Um, and so it kind of it was interesting to see how there's a little bit of a difference in the way they perform for visual novel versus performing for a much more condensed script that's meant for TV. Um, I I think they did a really good job with both, but it was still an interesting phenomenon to observe. Whereas, you know, if it was purely text, um, I might have had a totally different conception of how these characters behaved or sounded um, based on reading it and then watching the adaptation maybe being a little bit off-put by the difference in my perception versus what they did. Well, I think if you look at something like, for example, um, Final Fantasy X, a game that I don't, I didn't like, mm-hmm. um, and that was when I was hugely into role-playing games too, Japanese role-playing games, and I didn't like Final Fantasy X, and one of the big reasons for that was I didn't like Titus. <laughs> I didn't like a lot of the cast, but I didn't like Titus. Um, ha, 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 ha. Right. And a big point was the voice acting. That was a big part of it, the <laughs> performance there. Um, and I don't think Meg Ryan did a good job. You know, was, she was miscast, clearly, as, as the main character. Mm. Um, so I, I can't, I can't ha- talk about Titus and not have a Meg, Meg Ryan joke, sorry. <laughs> but um, looking at, like, say, in o- older games, like, um, say, Chrono Trigger, mm-hmm. like, that's, there's no voice acting in Chrono Trigger. It's just all... Um, the text and, and like the music kind of drives it, mm-hmm. and you're reading it in whatever voice you choose to give the characters, like you're reading a book. Mm-hmm. But when it becomes a performance by a character, um, now it now it becomes even more farther removed from your personal experience, mm-hmm. and it becomes 
everyone has the same experience. Mm -hmm. And I think it's like the difference between a film and a book. Um, and Doc, you've talked about this before too. Um, I'm not a Harry Potter fan, but you've mentioned this, and I thought, Heretic. I thought it's very, very Heretic. true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it was, I thought it was very true. Where you talked about everyone has their own when they're reading the books, their own view of what oh, Hogwarts yeah, absolutely. would look like. Absolutely. Right? Whereas in the films, they picked one, yeah. and that was what people saw, and yeah. that was what it is. And so that's I think we're moving, we're continuing to move farther and farther in that direction in games, and with the the. With performance art, with all these um, actors coming into it, being brought in, uh, the voice acting work, facial motion capture, and all that, um, we're moving closer and closer to or f- to the designer, the director of the games. They're giving you their exact experience of what they want you to see Correct. in the game. And this is also leading us to potentially um, more limited experiences. And I don't want to say linear Mm -hmm. because that's not necessarily true since we've been talking about open world games, Mm -hmm. but um, it is limited in the sense that you are deciding what these characters look like, you are deciding what they sound like, you are deciding the context in which it's taking place. Um, Well, more significantly, I think you're deciding, meaning meaning the designer, the, the writer, is deciding who... What the right thing to do is. Yeah. The, this is the correct narrative, and you either do the correct narrative or you fail. And if you fail, you try again. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and so you get the, the, the proverbial game over screen in one form or another, whether you literally do or don't. Um, and, and then even to the point where I think back to a couple of years ago with some of the Assassin's Creeds where it, you were looking for synchronicity. Mm-hmm. And if you did it exactly the way that you were supposed to and it was right, you could get 100% synchronicity. But if you did some stuff that the original, uh, I want to say it was Ezio, uh, didn't do, then, oh, you only got 60% synchronicity. Do you want to go back and replay that mission and do it, quote, unquote, right? Um, that was so completely meta for me. Mm. Um, it lost something. Yeah, and it's interesting, too, because really what it was was just kind of like a more completionist, like, hey, here's an extra challenge yeah, it really to, was. to play this section better. But it felt like shaming. But, yeah, they, they, they phrased it in a way that I think was like, you know, kind of a cool world-building thing, mm-hmm. that there is, like, the way that that was actually done, and you're trying to get as close as possible to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and they adjusted that in later ones because mm-hmm. I think there was some negative pushback on mm-hmm. that. But... Um, then there was there was other elements too, like there was some completely meta. Um, how was this mission? And then you can give feedback, and it's like you want to talk about just removing me from the gameplay yeah. experience. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's that's something that I think I, I do want to talk about too uh, when it comes to modern games and the direction that we're going. Because we talked a lot about it's all about the experience and, and all of that, and, and the director trying to get you into this world. And yet we have at the same time this this real clash of these meta elements that are in games Mm -hmm. like player feedback and influence and and achievement achievement unlocked Mm -hmm. just popping up in the middle of it like you're playing witcher you can get little achievements just pop up in the middle of the freaking game right i mean this is it just takes you right out of it yeah so on the one hand it feels like games are going in one direction and it feels like the designers want them to go in this one direction but then it feels like the i guess it's the producers are wanting to give this extra element, this, these meta elements as well. And I think a lot of the meta is, uh, to a certain extent, the competition of platforms between each other. They're trying, like, you know, PlayStation often says, like, we're trying to make PlayStation the best place for gamers. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but what does that even mean? Does that just mean shiny graphics, or mm-hmm. does that mean and processing that, power? And that, that's just the point, is that, like, you know, essentially, in a lot of ways, aside from, like, what deals people cut to have exclusives on one platform or the other, mm-hmm. um, like, you know, an Xbox One and a PS4 are basically the same platform um, in a lot of ways, and it's all the in meta. Of ways, yeah. it's, mm-hmm. it's the meta stuff, it's the networks, it's all this, d- these different things that they try to differentiate themselves with that create a different experience overall, the meta experience of being an Xbox gamer, a PlayStation gamer, a PC gamer, mm-hmm. all this different stuff that um, is interesting. Well, it's, from it's, a it's, hardware standpoint, all the hardware inside the consoles are six to ten years old, dedicated so that they feel really, really fast. Mm-hmm. Uh, but really, it's just it's pretty old technology. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's how they're so cheap. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so. I don't know. Without uh, this has been sort of a meandering talk, but I think interesting to kind of see because I do think that what we're what we're seeing with Death, Death Stranding, in my opinion, I think is this is reflecting the direction that games are going. In my opinion, I think it is going towards this um, less and less of a focus on the do mm-hmm. and more of a focus on the experience. I hope 
that if that's true, and I think you're right, I think it is true, but I hope that if it's true, it means that there, we're going to see a new genre up here, uh, there's going to be a split, and there's going to be the games that do that and the games that don't. Mm-hmm. Um, because I don't want to lose the ability to enter into a game space and be like, I'm in control. Yeah. I'm the author. I agree. As opposed to an tour experience, like you were mentioning earlier, I, I want to be one of the artists as a player, mm-hmm. um, like the Smithsonian talks about, or, mm-hmm. you know, and they did the Art of Games. Uh, they, they talked about that, and, and we've talked about it on the, on the show here before. And these are, these are, broadly speaking, trends that are happening in AAA. There's almost like yes. a little bit of an indie mm-hmm. counterculture that's trying to stick to the the old stuff but, but only some only a with even within indie a small subset within indie because I would also most argue that of the indie, indies are trying to be of the auteur space yeah, was, most of them are the trying are yeah. doing True. doing the exact like they're they're taking it to even the farther mm-hmm. extreme where there's practically no game there yeah. you're literally just, it's just arts yeah, art. yeah it's literally just interactive art so mm-hmm. that's where many of the indies live mm-hmm. so you're right yes some of the indies are mm-hmm. trying to live in that the do space the mm-hmm. the, the, the actual yeah actually space. you know that was one of the problems but, I had with Undertale. Yeah, as an example, mm-hmm. um, is I felt like it was more of a, a curated experience yeah. instead of an actual game that I had meaningful choices in. Mm-hmm. And the irony, of course, was, oh, look at the meaningful choices that are embedded in this game. It's so meaningful. Mm-hmm. And it, I feel like maybe it could have wasn't. been. I feel like it maybe could have yeah. been that if we didn't have the meta, if we didn't have the meta knowledge well, of what that's it was entirely to be. possible. Yeah. Um, but I think if you if you just to kind of go full circle and close this out because we talked about Legend of Zelda earlier and Mm -hmm. this is true for other Nintendo games as well Um, you see that shift in Nintendo games too you see that in that move towards the experience. I mean, mm-hmm. look at what we talked about with The Legend of Zelda, the Breath of the Wild trailer. Mm-hmm. Right. That was very much about the experience of this world. And you think about um, the way that you played The Legend of Zelda on the NES, the first Legend of Zelda. Yeah, the plot hook for the original uh, Zelda is it's dangerous to go alone. <laughs> yeah, take, take this. this. Take this. <laughs> and, <it's, laughs> and that's the so, plot hook. So what is it about? It's about I'm going to um, explore through this world, solve puzzles, and um, you figure know, out who battle. the Zelda yeah, chick and, is because there's a Zelda in here right, somewhere. But I'm going to battle or avoid monsters. Right. No, you're not playing. While I'm look, I'm solving puzzles, and it's all about the do. It's all about the the, the action, the do. Uh-huh. But the new ones are, you're supposed to feel impressed by the world that you're in. Yeah. You're supposed to feel like you're in this world. You, you you're not just you're not just on and screen. By it too. Yes, you're not just on screen playing this game trying to beat beat it. No, right. you're in Hyrule and you're trying to. Um, survive Hyrule, and you're trying to. Um, you're more present in the game, I guess you can say. Yeah. And this is something you see it in, um, you know, the Mario games too. Like you know, even like Super Mario Galaxy, it's like you're. That was a big push for that game. Was you know the vi- not just the, the visuals, but the aesthetics. Yeah. You know the yeah. music and the and, and the artwork as well. Well, I'll stick a pin in this for next week because right. I'm going to offend a generation. It'll be great. It'll keep them coming back next week. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> uh, but basically, uh, the, the the idea. Of Behind that is the the gameplay design of you are going to fail, you are going to fail, you are going to fail, you are going to fail until you succeed. Mm -hmm. Versus, come along on this journey I'm going to take you on. You might fail once or twice, but don't worry, it won't be too hard. You'll get it. That's just the learning curve, and then we will move on into other things, and it'll be exciting. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for joining us for episode number 85 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, our discussion on where games are headed. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. And we'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward compatible.